I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm pretty sure most people would recognize you off the bat, but if you could just give us a brief introduction about uh, who you are and what you do and uh, a little bit about your history in programming. Okay, I'm Joel Spolsky. I'm the uh, co-founder of Stack Overflow, um, which is now part of a company called Stack Exchange, uh, which I'm the CEO of. Uh, before that, uh, I uh, created a software company here in New York called Fog Creek, um, which uh, still is, still exists, and I'm still the chairman of that. And uh, um, I'm also, I guess, known best for my blog, Joel on Software, which I am now uh, mostly retired from blogging. But, uh, for about 10 years, I wrote um, something like a thousand uh, uh, articles on on Joel on Software about about the software development process. Right. I actually, um, I'm a big fan of Joel's because um, you know he's done a lot of great work with uh, Fox Creek Software and uh, Stack Exchange Network, which uh, I personally uh, love Stack Overflow myself and use it all the time. And I think it's a great tool to give and get help. Um, so, Joel, uh, we'd like to actually talk a little bit about interface design today. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, for example, is uh, some of your decision-making process behind uh, the stack architecture that went into building Stack Overflow. So, for example, you have the uh, Stack Overflow chat, which um, mm -hmm. mainly is uh, web sockets and real-time communication, which I think is a really helpful tool, um, and uh, the way that Stack Overflow sort of builds around its own community and self-governs itself. Yeah, so a chat sort of evolved out of the need for a real-time. I mean, we needed it for our own internal use, but we also needed it for sort of a real-time aspect of the community. And um, people use it it's sort of, it's starting to become a kind of standard substitute for IRC as uh, an easy place to go get an instant answer to a Java question. Um, there are certain types of conversations that happen in the comments on Stack Overflow that uh, are really one-on-one -on -one conversations that um, should really be, um, you know, sometimes they're arguments. Um, they really should be conversations of no record, meaning keeping a record of this on the Internet is just going to waste somebody's time if they ever find it. It should be a conversation between two people that are misunderstanding each other deliberately or not deliberately. But, um, and, and so a chat kind of served that, that, that niche need for real-time real interaction and also um, for a way for the moderators uh, and, the, and the staff of, of, of Stack Exchange to, uh, to communicate among one another in, in real time. Um, the, the meta was a really, really important com component of that. So all 99 um, Stack Exchange sites have a meta site um, dedicated to, to that particular site, which is where sort of the community governance happens. And, and in fact, there's a very strong correlation between the health of a community of a Stack Exchange site and uh, how many people participate in the meta. Um, you know, that's sort of an indicator that there's somebody that, that cares about it as opposed to somebody that's nearly there to get an answer quickly. Um, I think it's actually a good point that you bring up because I used to, I was at some point in time back, you know, in the early 2000s, very afraid of posting my questions on those forums uh, or forum like uh, sites where you would ask a question and somebody would actually respond with a nasty comment about, oh, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're doing, right. all along it would drag out and it would sort of be uh, going off topic, whereas on Stack Overflow, you actually sort of have already built into the interface things that um, per, sort of prohibit that long conversation style and yeah. just get straight to the answer. If you have, if we, if we get, I think more than, a, uh, I, don't, I don't know the number. If you get more than a certain number of back and forths in the comments, um, we, we, we actually, the interface will change and it will say, "Get a room," and it'll give you a button that takes you to a chat room with that other, that single other person that you were arguing with at that particular moment. Um, and that the "Get a room" feature is actually invoked surprisingly frequently. But, uh, but these are sort of the, the, the darker uh, uh, deeper corners of making a large uh, community um, of our size that works. I mean, another really important thing to remember about every decision uh, that was taken in the case of Stack Overflow is that um, most people like you are just afraid to post questions. Um, and, uh, uh, and very few people are, are actually uh, you know, excited enough about learning programming or teaching programming to actually answer questions. And so um, the actual number of people that type words into the site is, um, is fairly small. It's probably on the order of 50,000 a month. And uh, uh, the type, um, well, multiple times, who are frequently typing into the site. And um, uh, we, we, we got 40 million people visiting every month. And the, the other, the other 39,950,000 um, are just typing a question into Google and then we happen to already have the answer. And so something important to remember about our system is that um, we have a small number of people that are doing an activity that is the kind of activity that most people don't want to do, like ask and answer questions on the internet. And the byproduct of what they're doing is so useful 
that it benefits 40 million people just to have it there indexed clean, clean in, in Google. Right. So building out something like that really uh, because you have your long term goals that you want to build that Q&A and make that canonical so that over time people right. can search that and find it. Like you're saying, there's going to be, you know, 10,000 people for every one person that answers a question. Yeah, exactly. Who, who view that question. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's more like 200 because we're very long tail. Um, but there's a lot of questions. And and um, and so uh, when I look at a when I look at a question, you look at a question and answer, you see one person asked it, three people answered it. 20 people voted on some aspect of it or commented on some aspect of it, and 1,000 people maybe viewed, viewed it uh, if, it's, if it's useful. And that ratio is actually how we, we tend to prioritize things. And that means that for us, we're always going to optimize for the benefit of the people that come along later and read it rather than optimize for the benefit of the person asking the question. The per person asking the question is the, 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 the smallest uh, part of the equation. Like they're the least important. There, we, we, we've often said, you know, this person is like the sand in the, in the uh, oyster that creates a pearl. It's like that little tiny thing that instigated something awesome and beneficial for the Internet, but they just instigated it. And whether or not they got an answer, I could not care less. I mean, obviously, if they don't get an answer, they're not going to do it. So fine, they can have an answer. But <laughs> um, a lot of times you'll see somebody will type a question, and this is something I, I, I tended to encourage. Somebody will type a question. Nobody can figure out what the hell they're asking. Um, and then what I said is, you know, if you want to, just edit that into some other question that that's you actually, understand, uh, yeah, you that's, know the answer to. And that's absolutely one of the design decisions that I really supported about Stack Overflow is the fact that you can go back and edit uh, your questions and your answers because that does help in a lot of scenarios. Most people that are not, they're doing this as a hobby and they're trying to get some information about what's going on. They don't actually know exactly what they have to ask to get to where they want. So they might try to ask that X, Y question where, you know, yes. if I do this, will this happen? And they think that that will lead them to the answer they're looking for. Right. But yeah, but you, they rapidly figure out from the comments and the answers that they start getting that actually they should be asking something else. Or yeah, there's the the classic uh, uh, answer, which is done as a comment in Stack Overflow, which is like, um, I, I I can't do the question is, how do I do X? And the answer is you shouldn't. <laughs> like, why are you trying to do X? What's wrong with you? You should never be doing X. Uh, and then sometimes and and there are all kinds of typical fun things that come, come out of that, like, oh, well, but I want to do X, or, um, well, but how else will I accomplish Y? And then they say, oh, you want to accomplish Y? Well, don't do X. That's a bad way to accomplish Y. Try W. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's sort of where learning, learning takes place. But, you know, once again, um, a lot of times, uh, uh, the, all the value that's created is long after the original asker is, is, is gone. I mean, we make a big show out of rewarding people for answering a question that hasn't been a answered for a long time. Uh, and the original person probably doesn't have their problem anymore. You know, people will answer questions that are two years old um, just because they're like, wow, this is, this is actually an important question, and there is no answer for it, and I know the answer, so let me fix it. Um, and you know that the original person who asked it is long gone, but you also know that it's going to show up in Google results and that there's 100 people that have that question every month. That's true. And I used to actually get a lot of Yahoo answers in my Google results when I was searching for um, technical questions. Now they're mostly Stack Overflow, which I think answers my questions a lot better than it used to. And more likely to be correct. More and that's because of the editing and the voting and, and, and that kind of stuff. Why is it that you think uh, Stack Overflow works in comparison to other Q&A sites like uh, you talked in the past about Yahoo Answers and uh, mm -hmm. things like that? So yeah. you just share with us why you think it works and how the uh, user interface went into affecting that, whether it helped or hurt. But yeah. Well, first of all, um, just to like put some terminology around things. Um, although user interface in particular is important, um, when you're making online communities uh, or any kind of online commuter, computer experience that sort of mediates between people, then it's really how the interface uh, causes people to come together. It's not so much like we people used to talk about Kai, right? Computer human interface. Like what's the how does the human communicate with the computer? And the computer is a box. And the computer has now disappeared. And it's really a question of how humans communicate with other humans, what they do with each other. And that's what's um, that's what's really interesting about uh, Stack Exchange. And in fact, we could be making you know what, what's interesting and surprising to people is that you could be making every uh, interface mistake in the books and still have a very successful site. 
So an example of that would be Twitter, which nobody could understand. It's still very, very successful. Um, you know, like RT, which means retweet, and then that disappeared, and then the start with a period and an at sign. And there's a lot of impossible to understand stuff, but the human-to-human -human value was so high that people um, made it work anyway. Um, and uh, maybe an even better example is Craigslist, which, of course, has a reputation of having a terrible interface, or certainly not a pretty one. Um, but it works because there's a billion people on there. So um, w as soon as you're talking about human-to-human -human interaction, then um, you're really doing something a little bit different than traditional com computer human interface design. It used to be, when we talked about how to design a good user, user interface, um, you know, the old model used to be make the program model correspond to the user model. So make it so that um, the way the user thinks the program works is the way the program actually works, and uh, therefore it's e it's easy for them to use. And um, I could go on about that for a while, but now it's um, it's actually that's that's actually almost let's say taken taken for granted. Uh, you know, programs no mod no longer bother trying to explain themselves, and one of the reasons is that um, for a certain type of application, like let's let's take um, Facebook for example. They don't have to show you how something works because you'll see your friends using it and you'll just copy them. And, uh, and you'll try things with your friends and you'll explore it together and you'll have conversations and there'll be sort of maybe people talking about how it works as opposed to actually making it work. So that even though like retweets are not explained anywhere in the Twitter user interface and there's no way to understand what that is, once you get onto Twitter, you sit there and you watch it for a while and you're like, oh, I see. I see what they just did there. And then you click the button and you finally get it. So... Um, uh, it's that learning curve of um, whether or not it's going to be easy for the user to pick up on how to use the app. Right, right. Um, and, 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 and we used, we used to care a lot more about that than we do now. And either that's because it's a solved problem or because people are engaged socially while they're doing it. Um, what, is, what it turns out is really important in apps like Facebook, Stack Overflow, Twitter, Foursquare, is um, building um, a system, let's see, building a user-to-user uh, -user interaction system that is successful. And essentially, what you're doing is you're building a little society, and you're defining the rules for the society, and then you're enforcing those rules with the software. And sometimes the rules get enforced by the people themselves. The software doesn't even bother enforcing the rules. The people have just decided, like on our cooking site, cooking.stackexchange.com, they decided for some reason that they don't like recipes, and they don't want any recipes on their site. It's a site for questions and answers about cooking with no recipes allowed. Okay, fine. I wouldn't have figured that out, and it's not enforced by the software, but it's enforced by the community 100%. And, um, and it's just as important as the things that the software enforces. So if you could tell us maybe a little bit about some of the, um, for uh, in terms of an API and the back end of Stack Overflow, what you've done and some of the things that you found uh, helped expand this site vertically. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, that's a that's a lot of questions all at one. I mean, um, there's a, there's a bunch of aspects of what's going on. We tend to have a, a as a company we have a philosophy of um, default public. So everything we do by default we do out in the open. If we need to have a conversation about how to design something in Stack Overflow, then the conversation happens on Meta Stack Overflow, even if it's a conversation between our own employees. Um, all content submitted to Stack Overflow is Creative Commons. And we make the whole database available to everybody except for um, personally identifiable information, which obviously would be a privacy um, violation. But the whole database, everything that's on the website is available for anybody to download in, uh, in relational database format that they can play with and do things with. And so um, obviously we made an API that can access all that in real time. We have uh, the, our data site where you can actually type SQL queries that we will run against the Stack Overflow data right there and then uh, uh, that you can use for you know, trying to basically remix, reuse, uh, republish. Essentially, for us, it's very, very important that um, you know, we, we assume that everything in, that the company does will be will, will be public unless there's uh, a strong reason it shouldn't. And and um, it's a little bit of the open source philosophy of like how can we, you know, get the maximum benefit from our gigantic community of millions of people, uh, as opposed to merely the people that work for us uh, contributing. Right. And that's and those are some pretty um, ambitious long-term goals. So if you could tell us maybe something about, I know that when uh, Stack Overflow first started, you guys were just using a couple of servers and you had already reached you know tens of thousands of users. 
Um, over time, has that actually uh, cost you more in terms of uh, building out your hardware, or did you focus? Because I know that you built Stack Overflow using C Sharp, which was yes. sort of unheard so, of at the time. Well, we tend to use uh, yeah, we tend we use uh, we use .NET, we use C Sharp, um, and Microsoft SQL Server, and a lot of things like Redis and a lot of caching and all that kind of stuff. And um, we're absolutely obsessed about performance. So the actual our actual hardware footprint is very very small. I mean, I think we have um, 10, 10 front end web servers, which have a lot of overhead, and essentially Essentially, all of Stack Overflow is running on one SQL server, and the way we do that, I mean, it's got a hot, hot backup, but uh, a hot, you know, whatever you call it, a cluster, but um, it, uh, it, it, it's one box. And um, uh, the way we do that is that we just don't hit SQL Server very often. There's a lot of caching, and um, and we're obsessed about performance, and we use compiled languages. So uh, the, um, the the net of all this is that the, our actual hardware footprint is not very large. I think we have four racks, and they're about half empty. Uh, in New York, it's not a not a ton of um, hardware, and we're running um, at this point. Um, we're getting pretty close to um, 500 million page views a month, so it's a lot of a lot of pages that we're running. Right. Thanks, Joel. Uh, thanks. I appreciate you uh, joining us today, and thank you so much yeah. for your time. I hope you have a great day. Yeah, thanks a lot.